Welcome to Biblical Foundations, a podcast of the Center for Biblical Studies at Midwestern Baptist Theological Seminary. I'm your co-host, Jimmy Rowe, along with Dr. Andreas Kostenberger. Join us as we discuss issues in biblical scholarship for the church. Thank you for joining us today at Biblical Foundations. I'm joined by Dr. Andreas Kostenberger, who is the director of the Center for Biblical Studies. Today, we're continuing our series on biblical theology. In our last episode, we discussed the nature of biblical theology. And today, we want to explore the task of biblical theology. How do you do biblical theology? We want to discuss various approaches to the task and highlight some important resources along the way. Dr. Kostenberger, in your article titled The Present of Future and Future of Biblical Theology published in Themelios in 2012, you discuss four different approaches to biblical theology. First, a classic approach. Secondly, a central themes approach. Third, single-centered approach. And finally, a story or meta-narrative approach. Perhaps we can discuss some of the distinguishing features of each approach. What is the classic approach? Yes, uh, I found this to be a helpful taxonomy because um, not everybody um, engages in biblical theology the same way. Um, I I get the term classical approach from a passing reference in a footnote in in, uh, Greg Beale's New Testament Biblical Theology. Essentially, this is a book-by-book approach. For example, you might want to study the theology of John's Gospel. As I've done in my book, uh, A Theology of John's Gospel and Letters in the BTNT series. In keeping with the definition we discussed in the last episode, you would try to determine John's theology as expressed in his gospel by a method that is historical, inductive, and descriptive. In other words, you're not asking the question, how can I categorize John's theology, but rather, how would John have expressed his own theology, and how can I best present and describe uh, these sets of convictions based on the gospel John wrote at a particular point in history to a particular audience. Now, in my Johanna theology, I argue that there are three primary entry points into John's theological thought, the prologue, the purpose statement, and the preamble to the second half of John's gospel, that is chapter 1, verses 1 to 18, chapter 20, verses 30 to 31, and chapter 13, verses 1 through 3. In this way, the literary plan of the gospel proves to be a fitting entry point in studying John's theology. Incidentally, that this fits very well with the hermeneutic I've argued for in my book, Invitation to Biblical Interpretation, where I propose what I call the hermeneutical triad of history, literature, and theology. When I shared my discovery with a colleague in our English department a few years ago, by the way, uh, he looked at me and told me, well, of course, the beginning, the middle, and the end of a story. That's just what you would expect. I felt just a little sheepish when he told me this, but then later I felt that this was a wonderful independent corroboration uh, that I was on the right track in discerning what John's own theology expressed in his gospel really was. In my Johannine theology, therefore, I start with a Johannine worldview, which in turn is closely tied to his use of Scripture. Then I move to the Messiah and his signs, as these are front and center in the purpose statement, as well as in the first half of the gospel, the so-called book of signs. After this, I include chapters on creation and new creation, since the entire gospel begins with the statement, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. This opening clearly sounds the creation, new creation theme. After this, I discuss John's presentation of God as Father, Son, and Spirit. As you mentioned last time, Scott Swain and I have written an entire volume on the Trinity in John's Gospel, where we explore this in great detail. I also include chapters on Jesus' fulfillment of festal symbolism, the feasts uh, in in John's Gospel, such as Passover, Uh, another chapter on the cosmic trial motif, the, mis- the new messianic community, uh, the Johanna love ethic, John's theology of the cross, and John's Trinitarian mission theology. In each of these chapters, I believe what emerges is that John is a very creative thinker and theologian who expresses his thought in very distinctive ways, certainly when you compare them with the synoptic gospels, that can only be adequately understood if we allow John to be John. John. 
and try to discern his own thought historically, inductively, and descriptively. I think that's uh, very helpful. Uh, what about the second approach that you mentioned? How about the central themes approach? Well, uh, this is uh, such a uh, common approach that uh, for some people, they identify the central themes approach with the very nature of biblical theology. And I think that's uh, a mistake because uh, as I've argued in my Thamelius article, there's demonstrably uh, a diversity of approaches, at least uh, falling under those four different rubrics we're discussing. But as the name suggests, the central themes approach traces major themes through a given testament or all of Scripture, whether that's covenant or Messiah, creation, new creation, salvation, and so forth. Uh, Scott Havemon and Paul House's work is best characterized as a central themes approach, but there are many others. The NSBT series features multiple instances of studies of a given theme throughout Scripture, such as Mark Seifert's volume on justification or my work on mission salvation to the ends of the earth. Also, the Reformed redemptive historical approach epitomized by Gerhardus' Voss's classic volume, Biblical Theology, and more recently by people like Graham Goldsworthy, is essentially a central themes approach, if not a single center approach, in that it traces the progress of God's salvation historical plan and revelation uh, progressively through Scripture. What's important in this regard, though, I believe, is that any such central themes approach is still grounded in the classic book-by-book -book approach, so that the initial boundaries between books are respected and upheld, and the integrity of a given book of Scripture is preserved and maintained. In other words, I would advocate starting with describing the major theological features of an individual book of Scripture, and only then connecting the dots between books along certain central themes. And I might add, to do so in such a way that is sensitive to historical and chronological developments. An example of this would be studying Paul's writings and theology in the presumed chronological order of writing, as I've done in the forthcoming book on the Holy Spirit, which I've written jointly with Greg, with Greg Allison. Now, the third approach has probably been the most debated. Uh, what is the single center approach? Yes, uh, Garrett Hazel, uh, Dia Carson, and others have... Uh, uh, expressed their view that, that, that the single center approach is, 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 is unduly uh, reductionistic uh, because demonstrably there's multiple uh, central themes. So in, in a way, a central themes approach uh, might be preferable to a single center approach. Essentially, a single center approach contends that there's one and only one central theme in Scripture. In this way, it goes beyond the central themes approach that finds multiple major themes rather than just one all-controlling one. An example of a full-fledged biblical theo theology that uses a central themes approach would be Charles Scobie's The Ways of Our God, while pretty much the only single center biblical theology written in recent decades is James Hamilton's God's Glory and Salvation Through Judgment. Uh, Don Carson has once written that the best way of of testing the quality of a biblical theology is the way in which it manages to navigate the tension and strike the proper balance between the unity and diversity of Scripture. I think those are very wise words. Now, by that token, the single center approach does a great job underscoring the unity of Scripture, but in my view, it doesn't do so well when it comes to allowing for legitimate diversity in the way various authors of biblical books express their theological convictions, each in their own way, with their own distinctive vocabulary and their own unique vantage point. And finally, the story or meta narrative approach. Uh, this has been somewhat popularized in evangelical circles today with an emphasis on the storyline of Scripture. Uh, for example, what is the meta narrative approach? Yes, uh, and this has been all the rage in recent years. Uh, sometimes I feel like if I hear the, story, the word story one more time, you know, I'm going to uh, suffer uh, cognitive overload. Uh, the the, the meta-narrative approach is perhaps the most recent, and in my view, it, it, it does helpfully complement the classic book-by-book -book, 
uh, and central themes approaches. It's similar to the central themes approach in that it cuts across individual books and corpora and traces major themes throughout scripture. And in some ways, it goes even beyond central themes approaches in that it looks at the Bible as one grand narrative or big story. I'm thinking here of Christopher Wright's magisterial work, The Mission of God, subtitled Unlocking the Bible's Grand Narrative, or to some extent, uh, Greg Beale's New Testament Biblical Theology, where Beale sketches an Old Testament storyline and a New Testament storyline, which partially overlap and where the New Testament further develops the Old Testament storyline. Now, personally, I've learned a lot from meta-narrative approaches, and I certainly want to incorporate uh, the strengths of those approaches in my own methodology, but I continue to believe that book by book is a proper way to start so as to ensure that one's understanding of the meta-narrative of Scripture doesn't improperly overlook or underrepresent minor voices in Scripture. Otherwise, we might develop or operate within a canon within a canon that privileges major voices such as Paul while neglecting other authors such as Peter, James, or Jude to give uh, just one example. Uh, in the same way, in the Old Testament, we might overlook the contribution of various books in the wisdom literature or some of the minor prophets, for example. Now, I think these four approaches provide a helpful framework uh, for thinking about the task and how to approach biblical theology and how to do biblical theology. Uh, and perhaps we can turn our attention now more practically to preaching. Mm-hmm. For pastors preaching the Bible, how would you encourage them to incorporate biblical theology into their sermons? Well, that's a huge topic, and of course, we can here just give some practical suggestions. Uh, I'm a strong advocate of theological preaching, by which I mean preaching that is not merely expository, as important as that is, but one that shows interconnections between different books in the Bible in both Testaments, so that people in our churches get a firm grip on the whole counsel of God. One way we can do that is by preaching a single overview sermon on a book of Scripture, as I've done, such as Esther or Titus, in which we focus on the big picture and major themes of a given book, rather than getting too bogged down in the minutia. Second, as as preachers, we should be sensitive to the New Testament use of the Old, Uh, not only when it comes to explicit quotations— but also uh, in terms of thematic or conceptual connections. Third, we can preach any given passage within a whole Bible theological context. For example, if you approach the Bible as a meta-narrative in four movements, creation, fall, redemption, and consummation, or some similar terminology, uh, you can preach a given book, whether it's one of the minor prophets or, say, the book of Galatians, within the frame of reference of the Bible's overarching storyline. Me uh, fleshed it out a a bit more. Uh, In the case of uh, Galatians, for example, uh, rather than starting in in chapter 1, verse 1, and preaching through the book in expository fashion, a pastor could start with creation, move on to the fall and the predicament of human sin, and then discuss the law given through Moses, and so arrive at the historical setting for the book of Galatians. Uh, You get the picture. In a nutshell, biblical theology can give your sermons a more thorough theological grounding that will help your people see the interconnections of your preaching text with the rest of Scripture. So I would certainly highly recommend for pastors to give biblical theology careful consideration. Well, I think that's a fitting way to wrap up our conversation today. We've been discussing the task of biblical theology. How do we do biblical theology? Uh, We want to direct our listeners uh, continuing to our website at the Center for Biblical Studies, cbs.mbts.edu, and there you'll find further resources on this topic. Please join us next time as we continue in our series on biblical theology. Thank you for joining us today at Biblical Foundations. For more information, please visit the Center for Biblical Studies at Midwestern at cbs.mbts.edu. For further resources, please also visit biblicalfoundations.org. Please join us again next time at the Biblical Foundations podcast.